India is the second most populous country on earth, with over 1.3 billion inhabitants, yet the country's national football team has never featured at the FIFA World Cup. Given that Kuwait, Iceland and Indonesia have all featured at the World Cup finals, and bearing in mind that Iceland's population is just 0.0025% of India's, that is quite a shocking statistic. Whilst India is often thought of as a cricket-loving country, from Kerala to Kolkata, football does enjoy immense popularity in certain regions, and widespread interest sprinkled throughout. There was a time, in fact, when football was at least as popular, if not more popular than cricket in India, but for one dreadful decision by the All India Football Federation, it is possible that India would be a powerhouse of international football today. So just why did India turn down the chance to participate in the FIFA World Cup? Without wanting to draw you into a classic HITC7's history lesson, we must begin with football's arrival to what was then the British Raj in the mid-19th century. Great Britain first invaded India in the early 1600s through the British East India Company, which seized large parts of the Indian subcontinent, had an army twice the size of the British Army at its height, and was the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. By the mid-19th century, Britain had taken control of almost all of modern-day India and Pakistan, and the British Raj, literally meaning British rule, was instituted in 1858. It was also around this time that association football began spreading throughout the United Kingdom, from public schools in the south to the steel city of Sheffield in the north. As such, India was one of the first places that the British exported football to. Soldiers began playing organised games as early as the 1860s, and in 1888, the Durand Cup was founded. Named after Sir Henry Mortimer Durand, who was a British diplomat in India, the Durand Cup has run continuously during peacetime ever since, making it the third oldest running football tournament on earth, behind only the FA Cup and the Scottish Cup. Whilst the Durand Cup is now among the most prestigious football trophies in India, it was originally only open to British army teams hence why former winners of the competition include the Devonshire Regiment and the Lancashire Fusiliers. Eventually, the competition, along with football in India more broadly, was opened up to the general public though, and with much success. In 1911, Indian players proved that they could more than match their British counterparts, as Mohan Bagan defeated the East Yorkshire Regiment in the final of the IFA Shield. As someone from East Yorkshire, with family in the region going back generations, who now enjoys a fair deal of support from Indian subscribers, I quite like the idea that some of my ancestors could have competed against some of my Indian viewers' ancestors during the formative years of Indian football. I'm a little less comfortable with what some of them might have done in India off the pitch, so apologies for that, but we shall move swiftly on. Whilst there were a number of talented Indian players and teams, as a vassal state of the United Kingdom, India was unable to field their own national team. There were Indian representative teams that went on overseas tours, typically to other British colonies, such as Australia and South Africa. That all changed in 1947 with partition, independence, and the creation of the independent states of India and Pakistan. The All India Football Federation had been formed in 1937, but it was only in 1947 that India could create their own national team and apply for FIFA membership. Their application was granted in 1948, and India's first opportunity to compete as an independent nation came at the 1948 Summer Olympics, which were, ironically enough, held in Britain or London to be more specific. India sent a team to the tournament with almost no preparation. The country's first official fixture would come at the Olympics as they faced established European opposition in the form of France in the first round. Whilst a large number of British soldiers knew that India had some capable footballers, they were still considered rank outsiders. France had been World Cup quarter finalists in the last World Cup, meanwhile virtually nothing was known about the India team. In front of 17,000 fans at Lynn Road in Ilford though, the newly independent nation that was bursting with pride put on a display that earned them many plaudits. Though they were eventually defeated 2-1, India had run France ragged at times, and ought to have won the game were it not for two missed penalties across the 90 minutes. Princess Margaret was among the team's many admirers, so much so that King George VI invited the India team to Buckingham Palace despite their defeat. Looking to capitalise upon the team's popularity, the All India Football Federation, or AIFF, put on a number of exhibition games across Europe before the team returned home. In one such fixture, the India team defeated Dutch giants Ajax Amsterdam 5-1 in a result which gave the team further belief in their own talents. This ought to have been a springboard for success, 
especially ahead of the upcoming World Cup in Brazil. In the first post-war World Cup, FIFA's qualification process was rather rudimentary. Seven teams from Europe, six from the Americas, and one from Asia would be invited to compete, with various qualification processes competed across the globe. The Asian qualification group was made up of Burma, Indonesia, the Philippines, and India. India would have been overwhelming favourites, but they would never face any of their group rivals, all of whom withdrew from qualifying. India then had secured automatic qualification for their first World Cup within three years of gaining independence. Hurrah! Well, not so fast. India became one of three national teams, along with Scotland and Turkey, to turn down the chance to compete at the finals in Brazil. Scotland turned down the opportunity because they had foolishly stated that they would only go to the World Cup if they won the 1949-50 British Home Championships, despite FIFA offering a place to the top two teams. They finished second in their group behind England and therefore refused to travel voluntarily. Turkey qualified thanks to a 7-0 win against Syria but pulled out due to the prohibitive travel expenses involved in sending a team from Istanbul to Rio back in 1950. But why did India refuse to compete? It's a question that has been shrouded in myth, mystery and often downright misinformation for much of the last 70 years. In most of the Western world, it was claimed that India had refused because they wouldn't be allowed to play barefoot. Back in 1950, most Indian players liked to play barefoot. When the India team were asked why they played barefoot following their game against France at the 1948 Olympics, Captain Talamir and Au said, Well, you see, we play football in India, whereas you play bootball. It was a humorous response that further endeared the India team to the general public, but the India team took pride in their lack of footwear. During the almost 100 years of India's independence movement, as Indian teams began to defeat boot-wearing British soldiers whilst barefoot, playing without boots became symbolic, and a source of national pride. It was almost a USP which distinguished India from all other national teams, but after seeing India's players at the 1948 Olympics, FIFA introduced a rule banning players from going barefoot at the World Cup, and thus the myth that India turned down the chance to compete at the 1950 World Cup in Brazil because they had to wear boots was born. The truth was quite different. Whilst the India team often preferred not to wear boots for the reasons I've already mentioned, they were no strangers to donning them when necessary. The protocol was that India would play barefoot on hard ground and wear boots when it rained. Every player had a pair of boots and it wasn't unusual for Indian players to boot up, so to speak, halfway through a game if it started raining. In fact, at the 1948 Olympics, three of India's starting 11 wore boots for their game against France, meanwhile eight went without. I should also add that when I and other people say barefoot, I do not literally mean barefoot. Even players who went without boots wore socks or bandages strapped around their feet. Whilst Indian players of that era took pride in their lack of boots then, they were equally comfortable wearing them, and at most, FIFA's ruling would have led to mild irritation on their part. There have also been rumours that India, like Turkey, could not afford to send a team all the way to Brazil. This is not an unreasonable suggestion, since cross-continental travel in those days could be prohibitively expensive, but this wasn't the case either. Brazil was so keen to have an Asian representative at the 1950 World Cup that they pretty much offered to cover the entirety of India's travel costs. India had caused something of a stir at the Olympics, there was a real fascination surrounding their team, and Brazil were desperate to have the so-called Nation of Gandhi at their first World Cup, so cost wouldn't have been a problem for the AIFF. The truth, which was altogether rather more mundane, but somehow all the more infuriating in hindsight, is that India just didn't consider the World Cup to be particularly important at the time. The World Cup seems to have an unrivaled crown as the most prestigious competition in world football now, and for anyone under the age of, say, 70, that is all they have ever known. But it's worth emphasising, that hasn't always been the case. During the early years of the World Cup, the tournament was never without its sceptics. For the first tournament in 1930, the European nations practically had to be dragged to the finals in Uruguay by Jules Rimet whilst kicking and screaming, and still, only four European nations competed and none of them were among the continent's five strongest teams at the time. In 1934, reigning champions Uruguay boycotted due to the lack of European nations who had made the effort to travel to their World Cup four years earlier, many others withdrew from qualifying, and the competition's sporting integrity was thrown into further doubt due to Mussolini's influence on the finals and the referees. At the 1938 World Cup, 
every South American nation other than Brazil boycotted due to FIFA awarding the finals to a European nation for two consecutive tournaments. Meanwhile, Spain withdrew due to the Spanish Civil War and Austria's Wunder team were forced to withdraw when they were annexed by the Germans. And then, of course, came the Second World War and 12 years without a World Cup, so the tournament was not quite the universal holy grail that it would become in the period following the war. Perhaps most significantly, India had been under British rule for the last 100 years. England weren't even FIFA members between 1928 and 1946 and had treated the first three editions of the World Cup with disdain. England competed at the World Cup for the first time in 1950, but it's not hard to see how a century of the British Raj could have devalued the World Cup in the eyes of many Indians. As far as the AIFF were concerned, the World Cup was almost a distraction from the primary competition, which was the Olympics, in two years' time. Whilst it was most assuredly not the worst thing that Britain ever inflicted upon India, a mistrust of world football's biggest competition led to the AIFF making a catastrophic decision the impacts of which can still be felt in India today. The official reason given by the AIFF to FIFA stated that India will not participate in the World Cup. Due to late information reaching India, the team will have to be flown to Rio, resulting in cancellation of team selection meetings. Since there is not much time, the Indian team will not be able to prepare and hence it will not be correct to send the team. Yeah, it's a bit of a cryptic message. It is quite possible that in addition to doubts about the World Cup's prestige, India also backed out because of issues surrounding team selection, as alluded to in that message. It was a problem that plagued the AIFF throughout India's early years of independence with regards to who should and shouldn't make the national team squad. The selection processes tended to be incredibly difficult, disputed, and long-winded, and it's quite possible that the AIFF wouldn't have been able to find any unanimous decisions as to which players should go to the finals before the tournament began. Having passed up the opportunity of a lifetime, a place at the World Cup, without any qualification process, India's football team did compete at the 1951 Asian Games, not least because the new multi-sport event was held in New Delhi. India won gold in the football part of the games, beating around 1-0 in the final. Having pinned all of their hopes on the 1952 Olympics, India were thrashed 10-1 by eventual silver medalist Yugoslavia. The Yugoslavia team was an exceptional one, but the Indian players also appeared to have difficulties adjusting to the conditions of a blustery evening in Helsinki. The defeat brought an end to the barefoot era of Indian football, but while some used the annihilation at the hands of Yugoslavia as evidence that India's performance against France in 1948 was just a fluke, there isn't much evidence to support that claim. India had put in too many good performances in exhibition games and secured too many positive results for that to be the case. And whilst one suspects that they would have had a tough time at the 1950 World Cup up against Sweden, Italy and Paraguay, no doubt the conditions in Brazil would have been much more hospitable to the India team than they were in Finland. In 1954 World Cup qualifying, FIFA rejected the AIFF's entry, often thought to be due to their anger at India's late withdrawal from the competition four years earlier. This created a rift between the AIFF and FIFA that would span the next three decades, with India refusing to even participate in World Cup qualifying again until 1986. By that stage, Indian cricket had already enjoyed its seminal moment, a surprise win at the 1983 Cricket World Cup. Unlike the AIFF, with football, the governing body of Indian cricket, the BCCI, did capitalise upon their golden generation the sport has flourished in India ever since, whilst football has retained pockets of impassioned support, but far less funding, structure and government support. During India's World Cup qualifying hiatus, they were overtaken by a number of Asian nations in the beautiful game, and they haven't come close to qualifying since 1986. The fact that India's national team now sits outside of the top 100 of the FIFA World Rankings and were beaten by Tajikistan, Bahrain and Curaçao in 2019 is a reflection of their standing in the world game. There are individual flat blocks in Mumbai which are probably home to more people than the entire population of Curaçao, but big populations don't win football matches, talented footballers do. It is remarkable to think, and more than a little depressing if you are an Indian football fan, what could have been had India participated at the 1950 World Cup. Even a valiant group stage exit could have led to a further groundswell in popularity for the sport. 
India most likely would have been granted entry four years later for the finals in Switzerland, to which they would have qualified comfortably. It's quite possible that India would have cemented itself as Asia's strongest national team in the decades that followed, and become regular fixtures at the World Cup. Had that been the case, the Indian government might have ploughed funds into Indian football rather than cricket, as they did from 1983 onwards, and football could have become India's most prominent sport. There are so many what-ifs, but if that had been the case, India surely would have become a mighty force on the international stage. As things stand, even World Cup qualification for India seems like a pipe dream at this moment in time. Without wanting to seem too despondent, I think the future could still be bright for Indian football, just not for at least a generation or two. The creation of the Indian Super League has further raised the profile of Indian football, and some of the attendances have shown the thirst that exists, especially in certain regions, for the sport. Youth development is still miles behind though, and there are simply not enough clubs or adequate facilities throughout much of India to ensure that talent is properly nurtured. I think India needs a landmark event like holding a World Cup, which would of course mean automatic qualification, in order to give birth to a second golden generation of Indian football, and prompt more nationwide development of the game. Sadly, whilst I do believe India will hold a World Cup at some stage, it's unlikely to be anytime soon. The cost is exorbitant, Stadia has to be state-of-the-art, and FIFA would require the tournaments we held throughout the nation of India, not just in the cities with existing stadiums, and infrastructure that could be redeveloped. Anyhow, that is another video for a whole other time, but hopefully you now know why India turned out the chance to compete at the World Cup, and in doing so, possibly sacrifice the chance to become forced in international football for the next 100 years. Thank you all as ever for watching, hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7. Oh and as ever, you can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram, where the username is just at HITC7s on both.